So thanks everyone for coming to this talk. Um, my name is Efe Genjar, I'm a software engineer at LinkedIn Kafka team. And today I will present our work towards alleviating the management overhead of large-scale Kafka clusters using cruise control. So Kafka has emerged as a distributed messaging system for log processing. Following its inception, many established companies and startups adopted this technology as the backbone of their data streaming platforms. A number of key Kafka properties have been instrumental in this adoption. In particular, Kafka provides high throughput with low latency, persistent storage of partitioned data, as well as a total order within each such partition. But a full appreciation of these benefits requires a proper management of Kafka clusters. Before I delve into the details of cruise control to see how we can achieve this, to make sure that we are all on the same page because we are a diverse crowd here, I would like to go over a number of key Kafka concepts. Kafka runs on a cluster of brokers. The data is partitioned within topics and distributed over these brokers. Each such partition consists of a number of replicas. For example, the blue box here represents a replica of partition one from the blue topic. The uh, replication in Kafka is based on the primary backup model. So each partition has one leader and may have a number of followers that fetch data from this leader. If the replication factor is one, then there are no followers. So this was a quick summary of the server side. On the client side, producers generate data to a selected set of leader replicas, and consumers retrieve this data from the leader replicas for processing them in their own application logic. The followers come into play when there are leader failures. For example, if a broker dies, then the clients would be unable to produce to or consume from the partitions whose leaders reside on the failed broker. In such cases, Kafka automatically transfers the leadership of failed leaders to their corresponding online or healthy followers on the other brokers. So at this point, uh, we know how Kafka works. Now let's see why there's a need for managing it. One reason for this need for management is the growing size and number of clusters. For example, LinkedIn today has over 2.6K brokers, more than 44,000 topics, over 5 million partitions, and more than 4 trillion messages a day. And actually, these numbers are slightly outdated. You can consider them as higher as of today. Another reason is the frequent failure of server and network components in data centers. One other critical reason is the natural occurrence of the uneven distribution of resource utilization over brokers in our clusters. And finally, adding new brokers to or removing brokers from the clusters would also incur a management overhead. To satisfy these management needs, cruise control aims to provide dynamic load balancing on heterogeneous clusters, support admin operations for cluster maintenance, and enable anomaly detection with self-healing. The first target regarding dynamic load balancing involves a number of hard goals. These hard goals indicate the requirements that cruise control must satisfy. For example, rec awareness ensures that no partition in the cluster has more than one replica on a single rack. So as a result of this, if a rack fails, the availability of the partitions will not be affected uh, so much. The impact is going to be minimal. Capacity enforcement ensures that the resource utilization over brokers would never exceed a certain predefined threshold. And the resources here could be CPU, disk, or network bandwidth. And finally, enforcing the operational requirements would ensure that Kafka clusters would always operate some uh, predefined limits, such as always being under some maximum replica count per broker. Contrary to hard goals, soft goals are best effort. They typically require evenly balancing some X over brokers. And this X could be resource utilization, number of replicas, or number of partitions from the same topic. An interesting soft goal here is balancing the potential outbound network load. So this potential load corresponds to the hypothetical load under the scenario where all the replicas on a broker become the leaders of their corresponding partitions. This is an unlikely scenario, but even in this case, if we can provide a support for the cluster uh, to handle this load, then naturally the cluster would be more fault tolerant. The next target of cruise control is to support admin operations for cluster maintenance. And these operations include expanding or shrinking a cluster by adding or removing brokers, demoting brokers, which has two impacts, 
The first impact is to transfer the leadership of all replicas on the demoted broker away from it. And this, of course, requires the partition of replicas residing on the demoted broker to have some replication factor larger than one. And the next uh, impact is a little bit more subtle. It makes all the replicas on the demoted broker the least preferred replica for leadership election within their corresponding partitions. So this, again, requires and uh, is only relevant to partitions whose replication factor is three or more. This is because in order to make a follower the least preferred one for leadership election, you need to have multiple followers. The next admin operation is triggering preferred leader election to transfer the leadership from the current leader to the most preferred replica for leadership election within the partition. And finally, uh, the other operation is checking the health of uh, brokers and partitions. And this health check provides information about under-replicated partitions in the cluster, which are also commonly known as URPs, offline partitions, offline replicas, log dirs, and also the liveness of brokers. The final target of cruise control is to support uh, anomaly detection with self-healing. An anomaly could be a goal violation, a broker failure, or some metric anomaly. And the self-healing in this context indicates an automated action to fix the detected anomaly. For example, goal violations are fixed by rebalancing the cluster. Broker failures are fixed by decommissioning the failed brokers. And metric anomalies are resolved by demoting the abnormal brokers. So for each of these categories, we are going to look into their details while we discuss the architecture of cruise control. But let's first see uh, what are the building blocks for managing Kafka clusters. It turns out that there are only two key operations. And the first one is replica move. So a replica move changes the location of a replica from one broker to another. And this operation is a powerful operation with a broad impact on the cluster. So cruise control can satisfy almost any goals that we discussed so far using only a series of replica moves. But each such operation is expensive because depending on the size of a replica that we are moving between brokers, that might mean gigabytes of data transfer uh, within our cluster. And if we consider replica swap operation, which is a bidirectional way of uh, swapping or uh, transferring replicas in uh, both ways, this would potentially be even more expensive. So that's why we also have the other key operation called leadership move. A leadership move changes the leadership property within uh, the partition and takes it away from the current leader and gives it to one of the followers. So this operation uh, is cheaper because it doesn't require any data transfer, but the impact of a leadership transfer is limited to the resource utilization of CPU and outbound network bandwidth. At a high level, uh, cruise control uh, tries to solve a multi-objective optimization problem. This is the high-level challenge that it is trying to resolve. And it works on a number of conflicting goals while also trying to minimize the operational side effects of this process. So at this point, the incentives and objectives of cruise control should be clear. Now let's see how cruise control achieves these objectives. To do so, let's take a look at the architecture of cruise control on the next couple of slides. The system consists of a monitor, an analyzer, an executor, a REST API, an anomaly detector, and of course, the Kafka cluster itself. It contains a number of pluggable components that are illustrated by these orange rectangles. And these pluggable components enables users to customize their particular cruise control instance uh, for uh, their own purposes by implementing the public interface provided by these uh, pluggable components. And finally, the pink rectangles indicate the internal topics that Cruise Control and its metric reporter use. A metric reporter is a pluggable component that implements a public interface provided by not Cruise Control, but by Kafka. It reports a selected set of Kafka metrics to a particular metric reporter topic with a certain frequency. Cruise Control Metrics Supporter runs at each broker in the cluster and generates metrics such as leader bytes in and out rate, replication bytes in and out rate, incoming message rate, and so on. These metrics are used by the monitor component of Cruise Control. In particular, the key responsibility of this component is to generate a cluster model. This model is a representation of the actual cluster that Cruise Control can use. 
In particular, it shows the topology information regarding the distribution of cluster components, such as RECs, hosts, and brokers. Placement information regarding the logical entities and properties, such as replicas, leaderships, and partitions. And the current and historical load information for brokers and replicas for different types of resources. Users can also customize the uh, retention as well as the uh, validity requirements of the windows by changing the relevant configurations, such as the number of monitoring windows, the frequency of sampling, the length of each monitoring window, as well as the validity requirements or accuracy requirements of each monitoring window. Now let's take a closer look at each pluggable component of monitor. The metric sampler retrieves the reported metrics from the relevant internal topic. Then, using these metrics, it creates samples for modeling the load on brokers and partitions. The monitor aggregates these samples to create broker and partition windows. And during this process, the monitor might need to perform some extrapolations or estimations depending on the quality and quantity of the created or collected samples. The sample store is a component that is responsible for enhancing the fault tolerance of the system. It periodically backs up the historical load information to some persistent store. In case of cruise control sample store, it uses two internal topics to store the broker and partition load histories in a particular uh, load history set of partition uh, and uh, broker load history topics. So cruise control avoids data loss and a cold start upon transient failures by recovering the historical load information from the relevant persistent stores. Capacity Resolver is a component for retrieving the broker capacities in the cluster. In the current open source implementation of Cruise Control, uh, the source of this information is a file which is expected to be populated by users. But of course, if the users have access to some external service to provide their broker capacities, they can also use this as this is a pluggable component. Some interesting configuration that is relevant at this point is whether to allow or disallow capacity estimation. So this in particular is relevant to homogeneous cluster in case your external uh, service to provide the capacity of brokers fails to do so. The analyzer is the brain of the system. It generates the proposals to achieve goals with a near-optimal solution in a timely manner. And each goal has a corresponding priority that determines its optimization order. So as we discussed earlier, a goal could either be a hard goal or a soft goal. So a hard goal such as REC awareness and a soft goal such as resource utilization distribution. And cruise control must satisfy all the requirements of hard goals, but soft goals are best effort. And finally, the analyzer also supports a Kafka assigner mode by using a set of goals that mimic the way Kafka assigner distributes to replicas over, over the brokers in the cluster. So Kafka assigner is another open source project by LinkedIn. You can get more information about it on its open source repo. Proposal generation considers the current goal that is being optimized the already optimized goals, as well as the cluster model. And this process in particular prioritizes the leadership moves over replica moves and replica moves over replica swaps. Hence, as a result of this prioritization, the operational side effects uh, of this uh, process are attempted to be minimized. The executor is responsible for running the proposals uh, in the cluster. And while doing so, it also tries to limit the maximum number of concurrent leadership and replica reassignments. The users can customize these uh, limits by changing the either relevant configurations or the dynamic parameters for individual requests. It also ensures that there is only one active execution at a given time, so multiple concurrent execution on a Kafka cluster would not interfere with each other. And finally, it enables a graceful way of canceling an ongoing execution so that if you want to uh, do such an operation, the cluster will not end up in a bad, unpredictable state. Going forward, we also would like to provide integration with replication codas. So in open source Apache Kafka, this was introduced with KIP73. And this will further improve our throttling mechanism, which is currently based on uh, the number of replica or leadership transfers. Anomaly detector is a component for identifying the anomalies, notifying the relevant parties, and fixing the detected anomalies. An anomaly could be violation of an anomaly detection goal, broker failure, or a metric anomaly. And the notification could be in the form of sending an email to the relevant parties. And fixing the anomaly automatically requires enabling the self-healing for the relevant anomaly detector. Now let's take a closer look at each anomaly detector in the system. The goal violation detector periodically checks 
if there has been any goal violations in the cluster, and if so, it triggers an automated cluster rebalance operation. So uh, this operation is triggered for self-healing, and the goals used for detecting the anomalies and the goals used for fixing the detected anomaly can be configured independently. So for example, we can choose to pick only the hard goals to detect the anomalies, and while fixing the anomaly, we can use a larger set of goals. Broker failure detector is another anomaly detector that periodically checks if there are any brokers uh, that has failed in the cluster recently. And this uh, failure check is based on whether a broker is alive or not. So it ignores the brokers whose internal state has been getting progressively worse, but only considers the ones that are having some uh, fail stuff failures. To avoid misidentification of brokers as dead, which might be going through some upgrade, restart, or release certification process, the uh, broker failure detector uses some grace period. So a broker is configured as dead only if it stays down for longer than this grace period. For such brokers, they are removed from the cluster for self-healing operation, and this process ensures that at the end of the removal operation, there won't be any offline replicas residing on the dead brokers, and they will be moved to online or healthy, healthy brokers in the system. So you may notice that this process provides a reactive way of mitigating the issue. So this is a reactive mitigation example. But reactive mitigation has some challenges. So first of all, fixing an issue after the fact is expensive. Ideally, we want to fix it before we get to that point. Next, Kafka is an infrastructure service. It's uh, uh, being used by almost all the other services uh, building on top of this. So any issue that Kafka encounters will typically have an impact on the other services that depend on it. And this typically requires their immediate attention, which is not good. And finally, frequent service interruptions lead to poor user experience, again, another bad consequence that we want to avoid. The overall experience with distributed systems show that there is a tendency to observe the a correlation between the frequency of server and network component failures and the increasing size of clusters, the growing volume of user traffic, and in particular with hardware degradation. So in summary, solely relying on reactive mitigation with increasing scale is not really a great option. And this discussion regarding the feasibility of using reactive mitigation brings us to our final anomaly detector. The metric anomaly detector uh, periodically checks if there are any brokers with abnormal changes, so abnormal changes, in their uh, selected broker metrics. And if such brokers are detected, they are demoted from the cluster for self-healing. So in this context, we call such brokers as slow brokers. And contrary to the previous anomaly detectors, you might notice that this process provides a proactive way of mitigating things. At this point, a valid and critical question is, what constitutes an abnormal change in the metrics of a broker? And to answer this question, uh, we have a pluggable uh, component of anomaly detector called metric anomaly finder. And to provide an answer to this question, it relies on a comparison between the historical metrics and uh, the current metrics of the brokers. And in our current implementation of open source anomaly finder, this comparison is based on the percentile rank of the latest metric value. So the metrics to be used in this detection are also configurable. And the default configuration that cruise control comes with include things like local time of produce, local time of consume, follower fetch, as well as log flush time. And finally, the anomaly detector also supports running multiple concurrent anomaly finders, metric anomaly finders, uh, concurrently to detect uh, different types of anomalies based on their own individual algorithms and handle them maybe independently. Proactive mitigation also comes with a number of challenges. In particular, the root cause of the detected anomaly is non-trivial to identify. It could be due to some hardware issue, it could be due to a software glitch, or even a traffic shift might cause a metric anomaly. So that's why the mitigation strategy, or uh, the way we fix uh, this issue for self-healing, uh, is independent or agnostic of the particular root cause. So this provides a first line of defense uh, to enable uh, high availability in our system and provide good performance, whereas if you want to find out the root cause, this still requires some human intervention uh, to uh, investigate the issue. Cruise Control also provides a REST API to handle user requests on its sync and async endpoints. 
In particular, get endpoints include cluster load, which also provides information about the liveness of brokers, partition load, proposals for different types of goals that are provided by user. Uh, so you don't really run the goals with the proposals endpoint, but you in the, instead get the proposals and the final estimated cluster state with uh, the given goals uh, in the system. And also, cruise control state provides information about the substates uh, of cruise control, such as the executor, uh, the uh, analyzer, uh, the anomaly detector, uh, as well as the monitor component. Post endpoints, uh, before that, the Kafka cluster state provides information about the partitions and brokers in the cluster. So partition information might provide us uh, their distribution in the cluster, their online or offline status, uh, whether uh, the log disk that they reside on is alive or not, uh, and so on. Post endpoints include add, remove, demote broker, rebalance cluster, stop ongoing execution, pause or resume sampling operations, as well as fix offline replicas. In particular, the last endpoint here uh, is recently has been recently added uh, to cruise control with Kafka 2.0 support, and currently it's available in our 2.0 branch in uh, open source cruise control code. Going forward, we also would like to open source our graphical user interface to enable users to aggregate the management of multiple different Kafka clusters at a single central location. So before I delve into the analysis, the evaluation of cruise control to see how it works, uh, I would like to show a glimpse of how we manage the manager. So for this purpose, cruise control provides a number of JMX metrics on a port that is defined by the user. And uh, some of the selected metrics here include the executor metrics, which report the started, stopped, and ongoing executions in different modes. The mode here corresponds to the Kafka assigner mode or not. The status of balancing tasks, such as whether a task is in progress, pending, stopped, aborted, aborting, and so on. Anomaly detector metrics provides information about the rate at which certain anomaly is detected. And monitor metrics provide uh, the uh, performance of cluster model generation and sampling process. The analyzer metrics provide the uh, proposal generation uh, statistics in the system. Now, let's analyze how cruise control performs in the wild. So this figure shows the all topic bytes in rate per broker, so the bytes that are coming to the broker uh, and their rates. X-axis shows the time in hours, Y-axis shows the incoming data rate in bytes per second, and each line here shows an independent broker in the cluster. This particular cluster has over 60 brokers, and we disabled auto uh, action taking, in other words, we disabled self-healing in this cluster, so we take manual actions uh, on this uh, particular cluster. The dashed line on the left side, uh, the vertical dashed line on the left side, shows the time at which our engineers, service reliability engineers, decided to remove some brokers from the cluster and uh, rebalance the remaining brokers uh, on the cluster. And the other vertical dashed line on the right side, uh, on the far end, shows the time at which cruise control is done with the remove broker and rebalance operations. So you may notice that before starting this operation, there was an imbalanced distribution of uh, the incoming uh, byte rate uh, to the brokers. And by the time the rebalance operation is completed, we observe a clear convergence. Similar to the previous results, all topic bytes out rate also indicates that there was an imbalanced distribution before starting the uh, broker removal and rebalance operations, and we observe uh, a convergence by the end of the rebalance process. And one interesting to maybe notice here is that there is a light, light green line uh, at the, through the bottom of the uh, figure that is going down to zero. So this line indicates the broker that is being removed from the cluster. And actually there are two brokers being removed from the cluster and this figure shows it more clearly. So uh, this figure shows the number of partitions per broker, again for the uh, same set of brokers for during the same uh, time frame. And uh, there are three key observations that we are going to make in this result. So the first observation is that uh, we notice that there's a light green uh, line uh, with uh, showing much fewer uh, number of partitions on it compared to the other brokers in the system. And this is because this broker was recently added to the cluster, but no rebalance operation was performed. So the load that it currently has on it, the number of partitions that uh, it, has on, it has on it, are due to the topic creation operations. So in Kafka, when we create new topics, it has its own algorithm to distribute the partitions of the topics that is being created. And uh, so that's why it has less, uh, less partitions on it. Uh, 
The second observation here is that, based on the previous two results, we have observed an unbalanced distribution of resource utilization or the bandwidth, uh, network bandwidth usage uh, on the brokers. But here we observe that the number of partitions on brokers are more or less equal. But uh, it doesn't really imply a balanced uh, incoming or outgoing, outgoing uh, network uh, utilization. So this is actually a very natural uh, thing. Uh, so this is because there are some topics that are very popular, that are being used very frequently by the clients, but there are also some topics that are not used at all. So if a broker ends up with partitions from the popular topics, then it will naturally have more incoming and outgoing uh, network load. So it's a non-trivial problem to achieve this uh, balanced operation. It has multiple aspects. And the final observation that we make here is, by the time we uh, complete the rebalance and remove broker operation, we observe that the two brokers being removed from the cluster uh, has uh, zero partitions on it. There, the, the broker that has fewer number of partitions on it goes up to the level of the other brokers, uh, allied brokers. And finally, the remaining uh, brokers in the system also reach to a state where they have equal number of uh, partitions on them. So in summary, uh, Cruise Control provides a system that provides an effortless management of Kafka clusters. And it achieves this by providing dynamic load balancing on heterogeneous clusters, supporting admin operations for cluster maintenance, and by enabling reactive and proactive ways of mitigation with anomaly detection and self-healing. So as a future work, we are also uh, thinking of integrating Cruise Control with the other open source projects, such as Apache Samza and Helix. Uh, you, you might have also heard about these projects. And um, the content that uh, we discussed here uh, as part of the presentation, everything is in the open source. Uh, so the repository uh, is there. We can go and uh, clone the repo, uh, follow the tutorial, and in maybe three, maybe five minutes, we can have our own, our own cruise control instance that manages our project. And we also have a GitHub room to uh, support our open source community. So uh, we try to be helpful on that front as well. And uh, so finally, I will also show some demo. And in this demo, I'm going to share with you two endpoints, two particular endpoints. The first one is going to be a get endpoint. Uh, we discussed Kafka cluster state. So Kafka cluster state, as you may remember from my uh, previous discussion, is an endpoint that provides information about partitions and brokers in the system. So in particular, it shows their distribution, whether they are in sync and out of, or out of sync uh, uh, with the rest of the, uh, rest of the replicas uh, in the cluster, uh, and so on. So this particular uh, use case will show uh, a cluster uh, that we are managing, which contains 15. Uh, uh, there's a question? No? Uh, OK. So this particular cluster we have has uh, 15 uh, brokers. And uh, one of these brokers is dead. So uh, what we are going to observe in this Kafka cluster state uh, will show that uh, the broker that is dead can be identifiable by just looking at the uh, cluster state information. So we are running it on localhost because the instance of cruise control is on our local box. And the port number is configured, will be configured to be 2540. And for readability, we pipe it to less. So here, if you look at 1473, the broker ID 1473, uh, it shows that it has zero leaders, it has uh, over 7,000 replicas, and there are also some out of sync replicas, and which is equal to the number of replicas on it. So this is the broker that is down. And uh, for the rest of the brokers, we observe that uh, they have some uh, distribution of leaders that are less than the number of replicas. So this is because this cluster has a replication factor more than one. That's why it has uh, less leaders than the number of replicas. The second part shows information about the partition status, uh, contrary to the first part, which shows information about the broker status. So we can see the replica distribution of each partition, whether they are in sync or out of sync in the cluster. And uh, we observe that anything that is on 1473 was on out of sync. Now, uh, we can also use the verbose option uh, for this endpoint to get more uh, fine-grained information about the distribution of even uh, the brokers that are not uh, out of sync. So by default, it shows only the out of sync uh, details of the partitions. So the second part of this uh, demo for the same endpoint shows the uh, use of the same endpoint for Kafka 2.0 clusters. So the previous example was from Kafka 011. So with Kafka 2.0, there's some additional support that provides uh, more information about uh, the log there's as well. So uh, this cluster has five brokers, and uh, it was configured with a JBot support. So what, what it means is that we have 10 different uh, data directories, and it's not on one disk. Instead, it's on 10 different individual disks. And uh, the health of uh, one disk determines whether that uh, log there, particular log there, is going to be alive or not. 
And here we observe that 1366 uh, has nine offline uh, replicas, which means that uh, there are also some online replicas because it has some leaders, it has uh, more replicas than nine. Uh, it means that these nine replicas are residing on the dead disks. And uh, the first part provides us information about this. So this last column of offline is the new thing that we haven't seen it on O11, but only on uh, 2.0 support of Kafka. And if you look at the details, we can also see which offline log there uh, is there. So in particular, mount point eight uh, indicates that it resides on an offline disk. So um, we, we may want to go and fix it by changing the disk maybe. And we can also get information about uh, partitions with offline uh, replicas or under-replicated partitions. So these offline replicas are a subset of these under-replicated partitions because uh, a partition uh, might contain under-replicated, uh, under -rep a replica might be behind, but maybe it's still be online, but in this case they're offline as well. So we can find information about this. So this was the uh, get endpoint example. Now I would like to uh, uh, go ahead and uh, look at one of the post endpoint examples. And for this one, we are going to look at the triggering preferred lead relation example. So, as you may recall from my talk, uh, the uh, preferred lead relation uh, is something related to moving the leadership within a partition to its most preferred replica within the partition. So what does it mean to be the most preferred replica? It means that when the uh, topic was created, the partition contains one replica that is designated as the most preferred one. Uh, this is for some static uh, distribution of uh, leadership and its corresponding load in the cluster. Because leader leadership also comes with an extra load for both CPU utilization and outbound network load. So initially Kafka tries to be a little bit clever about it to make this distribution such that uh, they will not end up in a single uh, place. So that's why we have the uh, preferred leader. And in this case we observe that 1473, uh, again we are using the Kafka cluster state, 1473 has no leaders but it has uh, 7000 something replicas and there is nothing out of sync. So this means that we uh, have this broker as alive uh, but after it came back up, so it died at some point and gave away its leadership to the other brokers in the system. Well, as we discussed earlier, Kafka handles this uh, leadership transfer automatically to provide the availability. But when it came back up, it didn't receive the leadership back to uh, its uh, old leaders. So that's why it ended up with only followers. So now, uh, when we run the uh, preferred leader election, we will observe that it will receive uh, the leadership back to itself. And uh, so if we look at how we do this, so we have a post endpoint here. So, and this post endpoint is contrary to the Kafka cluster state is an async endpoint. So that's why we are, so this is a curl command and with dash C option, we are passing some cookie to it. Uh, so as an async endpoint, we would like to st store our uh, session ID in this cookie and use it uh, in, in case we need to. And again, uh, similar to the previous case, we are running it on our local host. Uh, so that's why we are using localhost 2540. So dry run through here indicates that we want to get the estimated result of running this operation without actually running it on the cluster. So this is going to be some uh, estimated or expected result. And in this case, it's going to give us the exact result for the distribution of uh, leadership. And um, as expected here, we observed zero data uh, movements uh, and some number of leadership movements. <clears throat> so this is because this operation, preferred leadership election operation, does not require any replica moves. And we know that replica move is the one associated with data transfer. So, and the next part here shows uh, some statistics on uh, running this goal. So, uh, fixed indicates that it took some action. Uh, so, to uh, run this goal, made some changes in the existing cluster state. And we also observe that cluster load after rebalance uh, shows the estimated disk usage, CPU usage, leader bytes in rate, follower bytes in rate, network out rate. Uh, so the next part shows a potential network outbound rate. We discussed this again in the presentation and the distribution of leaders and a number of uh, replicas in total on that broker. So it shows that 228 leaders are coming back to this, uh, back to this uh, broker. And then if you want to run this on the dry run, uh, not the dry run mode, but actually want to run the uh, actual preferred leader election, we can just change the dry run to false and run the same command. So concurrent uh, leader movement uh, parameter here indicates the level of concurrency that we want to run our uh, 
preferred leader election on the Kafka cluster. So 500 means that overall, at a given time, there, will be not, there won't be more than 500 concurrent leadership transfers in the cluster. And again, the uh, final outcome here indicates uh, the same results that we run with the dry run uh, equals true. And again, here we observe that uh, the number of leaders on uh, our uh, broker increases from zero to 228. So after giving it some time, when we look at the Kafka cluster state again, uh, leadership transfer is a fast operation. So uh, here we go. I, we have seen that the number of leaders is already 228. It's completed. So, and this is how we run the preferred leader election in our cluster. And with that, uh, I will take questions. Mm -hmm. So uh, the self-healing actions are performed uh, as a result of some, for example, goal violation, broker failure, or metric anomaly. Whereas uh, the non-self-healing actions that users can take could be due to, uh, if I understand your question correctly, some external request coming to the uh, endpoints of the cluster. And during both operations, in order to prevent our model uh, training, so, so let's say, to be affected from the uh, this artificial uh, data movement process, uh, we pause the uh, metric sampling. So during this time frame, uh, we don't collect this data, but by the time the execution is done, then we continue our metric sampling and uh, continue uh, with the cluster model uh, update. Yeah. Any question? So we can think of topics as uh, like abstract uh, context where we store the data for a certain, let's say, application. And um, for example, a common example is uh, a page view event uh, topic. So which means that every time I go to LinkedIn.com or uh, any other uh, system that uses uh, Kafka, they might have some event associated with your visit to that website. And every time you visit that website, a particular event is created and sent to a topic known as page view event topic. And then this is the produce site. The topic uh, has a certain number of partitions and you produce to that topic. And then there are internal consumers of that topic that make some analysis uh, on the data that is collected. Uh, so they can infer what are the times that people are visiting more frequently, etc. So the individual topic creations is context specific. So there could be different applications and one application may prefer to create a single topic, whereas uh, another application might want to create multiple topics for its own purposes. For example, we have seen that within Cruise Control, one of the pluggable components called uh, Sample Store, Cruise Control Sample Store, uh, uses two internal topics for its own purposes for storing the historical load information of brokers and partitions independently. But we could have also chosen to st store them on a single uh, single topic or even you know independent of Kafka itself we can store it external on an external uh, persistent store. So um, the decision regarding how many partitions should I have, uh, how many, uh, what, what is the replication factor uh, that I need, etc. These are uh, things that are decided on the uh, topic creation time. And these are external to cruise control. So cruise control itself does not make any changes on the replication factor or number of partitions uh, of the given topics. Whereas it looks at its historical uh, usage uh, data and uh, tries to make some uh, some uh, educated decisions on where to move things around, including uh, the leadership uh, as well as the replicas, to understand uh, a more desired state. And by the way, the desired state here uh, does not necessarily have to be a load balanced state. So I can create any goal. These goals are also pluggable. So I can say that, for example, I create a goal called uh, narcissist goal, where I keep every, every topic that contains my name in it uh, on one broker and everything else on the other broker. So I, it, it's it, totally on my discretion. So I can decide on what to do. So is there a way to find out? Dead look, dead, dead luck. Sorry, I, I can't. 
deadlock. Oh, okay. So by deadlock, do you mean? Uh, uh huh. Uh, I see. So, uh, if I understand correctly, the question is about uh, a broker might uh, be stuck, and is there a way to detect this uh, using cruise control? Uh, definitely. So we can determine what it means uh, to be stuck. And uh, for example, in our definition, it could mean that if there is a broker that uh, used to receive uh, a high level of traffic, whereas uh, currently the traffic that it receives seems to be, uh, or, or traffic that is flowing out of it, the outbound network traffic from the uh, uh, broker is abnormally low or abnormally high. So the metric anomaly detector uh, can also use this uh, as its detection strategy based on some algorithm in its uh, metric anomaly finder. And then based on this, it can create an alert. And then uh, the users would be aware that there is a broker uh, that behaves uh, abnormally based on our definition of uh, what it means to be abnormal in this case. So there is a second talk. Uh, the second talk, second part of this talk is uh, from Zorn. Uh, so I will leave the stage for him. So the second part is the. So the second part of the talk we will talk about what happened under the hood when your data is missing in grid. So I. Okay, yeah. I'm a software engineer, site reliability engineer at Lincoln on Kafka team. What we do is that we maintain the Kafka stream stable and that we can put everything into the grid for our data scientists to do the computation, machine learning models. Yeah, so we are getting to the... Yep. Okay, so it all has happened on one page view event. That's the green balloon there. And when you view the website of Lincoln, it generates a page view event or it generates a user request event, it generates a lot of events. And it goes into our Lincoln stack, into our Kafka pipeline. It's the centerpiece. And then we have Goblin inside Lincoln that's going to gobble up whatever in the Kafka pipeline into our Hadoop grid. Then our data scientists What's up? Pop up window. Let me get it. Get rid of it. Got it. Okay. <laughs> it's dictionary. Okay, that's a pop up window. And let me bring up the pointer. And then we have the goblin, um, gobbling up all the messages inside Kafka into Hadoop. And then we have the creative data scientists to do all the feature extrapolating and then generate the user model, the article models, and then to attract more users to Lincoln platform and contribute to the member experience. Then the other day, we decided to build out the second data center, just not the first one. Then we have another blue message coming into the second pipeline. All things are good. You start building your model inside the Hadoop, the second data center Hadoop. Then, what happens when you actually want all your data just inside one Hadoop? You don't want to just gobble it off remotely to do the same processing again. So this is what we end up building. We build up an aggregate Kafka cluster to do the aggregation from the first Kafka stream and the second Kafka stream into an aggregate Kafka stream. So what we are using here, we're using a mirror maker. That's a open source Kafka utility that will bring you the mirror maker to mirror make from the first Kafka stream or the second Kafka stream into the one Kafka stream. So life's good. You have a green message pop up into the first data center, and then it ends up into the aggregation cluster. And the, the blue 
message goes to aggregation cluster as well. And Goblin happily just gobble all the things up into our Hadoop. Then you run your data model there, and it contains all the data center's messages. Awesome. Then on a bright Friday morning, you went up to your office. Holy shit, something's broken. I thought I put the job last night, and I want to see the result now. What happened? So there's a third message coming in, an orange message. Wants to go into the Kafka cluster, the local cluster. But our mirror maker stopped working. So it doesn't mirror up to the aggregation cluster. At that point, you run your job and then figure out there's only two messages. It's not all the message you want to consume. So your model is not right. How do we prevent this from happening inside LinkedIn? So in LinkedIn, we have a separate topic that's separate, it's transparent from the user. This topic, we have a Kafka console audit. It's a Kafka consumer. What it did is just keep on consuming the messages inside the topic, the user's topic. For example, page view event. Here, this consumer will report that I see two messages in this time period and then put it into a separate topic. We call it a tracking monitoring event topic. And then in a separate data center, this Kafka console audit put the one message into the tracking monitoring event topic. Also, here we have the aggregate tracking. We put it into the separate TMME here. And the backend, we use a MySQL database to store this information. By these green arrows, they are Kafka auditing. This application is going to consume whatever our Kafka console audits count and then put it into our MySQL database. So here, as we can see, Goblin will query the MySQL database and see if this time slice has the exact message from exact message count from the local tier and the aggregate tier. If it's not complete, it will wait till it's complete and then start processing. Then it will gobble all three messages back into Hadoop. That's how we prevent the bad things from happening. So in this scenario, there's three messages from local tier and two messages from aggregate tier. Okay, let's go back to the mirroring part. So what happened actually is wrong under the hood. We have mirroring problem, so it's a very general problem. So what happened to Kafka Mirror Maker, it's a very simple consumer. Inside LinkedIn, we have several thousand topic in one cluster, in a local cluster. And what simple consumer, uh, sorry, not simple consumer, and what a consumer doing is that it's doing a whitelist to mirror make all the several thousands topic into aggregate cluster. So for the whitelisting, it's a very complicated round robin bandwidth sharing. If you have a very high throughput topic, such as page view event, it will just use up all the bandwidth and the other topic will not get the proper bandwidth a lot of time. This is open source mirror maker. So what do we have inside LinkedIn? So for inside LinkedIn, we have Brooklyn. You can see the talk from stream meetup that's a quarterly meetup we hold on Lincoln. We have the YouTube video for Brooklyn. And for Brooklyn, what we have is a connector to connect from Apache Kafka or Microsoft Event Hub to a different kind of output, such as Apache Kafka again, or Event Hub, or Data Lake, or Hadoop as well. 
So what we have in the Brooklyn, it's going to have a different controller that's not going to trigger a rebalance every time when a Kafka mirror maker goes down or up. So I didn't mention about the rebalance part earlier. Let me talk about rebalance. One of the another scenario about mirror maker that when mirror maker start up, it will generate a rebalance to talk to other mirror makers to say, hey, I want some load. Give me some load. I can start doing the mirroring. But this mechanism is going to stop the whole world. And whatever it's generating, whatever it's mirroring from other mirror makers will get dropped sometime. And after the rebalance finished, we can start mirroring again. How many mirror makers we're talking about here? Some big cluster, we have around 250 mirror makers. So a rebalance can take up to 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and all things stuck inside a local cluster. That's the part that we start using Brooklyn Mirror Maker to handle all the difference. So Brooklyn is not open source yet. If you want to check it out, also on Stream Meetup, Uber has a very interesting model. They are using U Replicator. The way they handle it is that they don't trigger any rebalance at the time the new U Replicator start up. This is also the same to Brooklyn. So the rebalance over um, the rebalance the rebalance overload will be spread well. So the re replication is not going to stop when doing a rebalance phase. So here's your Friday. Then after weekend on Monday, uh, mirror makers goes very well. But then your data is still not in Hadoop. What happened? You expect on Friday you submit a job, you want to see the result on Monday, but it's not there. So it turns out Kafka console audit is using the same consumer as mirror maker. So when it wants to consume from the local tracking cluster, it's doing a double count. What happened is it's generated the event, it counts the event for two messages put into the TME topic, and later it crashed for some reason. So it generates another two events to the local TME topics again. So in the perfect scenario, you come up with five local messages. And the aggregation tier only give you three. So the aggregation, the Hadoop Goblin, when query the MySQL database, it just stuck and waiting for the two non-existing message forever. At this time, we have a incident and Goblin team needs to figure out all what happened on the miscounting. And after we figure out it's a miscounting, Goblin team have to do a very, um, very heavy procedure to overwrite the settings to tell it actually the message is complete. So for the takeaway here, Kafka is actually not a exactly once message delivering system. You always want to handle it with expectation that it will overproduce. So in this scenario, if you are going to design such counting system, make sure your MySQL query database have a strong enough logic to handle this kind of scenario. What we end up doing is that we end up seeing different data center count. In this, we have different aggregation cluster in different data center. For example, the one I'm pointing at, we have it at this data center as well. So if we observe every data center in aggregate tier, we have three messages. We end up saying, okay, there's actually a message overcount on the local tier. So we're safe to skip the operation of checking and keep on generating the models into, uh, keep, keep on generating the data into Hadoop. All right. So that's this part of the talk. If we have any question, Here's a good time. And thank you. I'm Zorn.
Go ahead. Sure. So this top, this question is about the MySQL sharding inside our Lincoln setting. So in the MySQL, we have a different kind of sharding, but basically we use the default sharding and use timestamp, a lot of timestamp, and then also the topic name hashing. This based on ba two, basically is two. And in the earlier design, we only have topic name for some places. And then we migrate into a timestamp base. Currently, we're using 10 minutes windows. So in the scenario I give here, it would be t this 10 minutes from 12.10 to 12.20, we have three messages. And 12.20 to 12.30, we have 10 messages. This kind of comparison. Yes, so the question is cruise control, does cruise control touch this part of in infrastructure? And the answer is yes. So how we do work is that we have a track and monitor event. This is also a Kafka topic. And currently we have 64 partitions uh, in most of the cluster. So when we have 64 partitions, it needs to be balanced out to different um, brokers as well. All right, everybody give a huge round of applause for Zorn and F.A.